Well, um, we're going to step into the Word here shortly. I'm going to pray over our time together. I've got some big news to share and some I uh, just want to kind of catch us up to speed and give us some next steps of what's going on in the life of our church. And so, uh, really, I'm just going to pray and commit this time to the Lord, and we'll kind of see how it shakes out. But let's, uh, let's go before the Lord right now. God, we pray right now that you, by your Spirit, would take captive my mind and my lips. Uh, I pray, Lord, for the future of our church, and I'm asking that your hand of favor would be on her. I'm so grateful for these people as I look out at them and and even as I hop online and I look at my friends who are watching from home, Lord, this, this is an incredible group of people. And we have a, a bright future together because of Christ and what he's done for us. And so, Lord, we're just looking to you. At the, you know, here's what we want, what we're committed to is just following your leadership in the life of our church. And so today we commit the time that we've got here, that we're gathered together, and we ask for your blessing on it pray, Lord, that you would bring clarity. I pray, Lord, that you would give us um, a clear vision of what you're doing and then a willingness for, for us to pursue it together. And so take this time captive. And uh, as you know, Lord, I don't really know how this is going to go or how much time is going to be allotted to each of these things, but you do. And uh, you, you know best. So have your way. Amen. Amen. Well, let me start. Here's the plan, uh, the, the rough outline. I need to give you an, an update on a pretty significant announcement, and I'm going to walk you through that, and then, Lord willing, we'll turn the page and, and jump into the Word in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So if you've got a Bible and you want to get there, we'll, we'll get there eventually one way or another. Well, the crazy news that I need to share with you is there's a possibility, there's an opportunity for us to purchase property right now. Um, it's kind of crazy. It was not the plan that I had. In fact, I've told God that a lot of times, like that's inappropriate for us to even be talking about that, you know, to, to purchase property. I mean, we are a, a baby church in the sense that just recently we incorporated as, as a church. And so for us to even be having this conversation, uh, just feels like, God, that's not right. That's not how it's supposed to work. And that's inappropriate. And then it's like, oh, wait, who, who am I to tell God his timeline or his plan? And so I'm just being honest with you, but there's an opportunity for us to purchase property. And I want to tell you about it, but I want to frame it out with um, just what I've sensed that God has been doing lately. So the truth about our campus is we have been in five different locations in five years. I mean, one of the locations twice, but we have been moving around the state line area for a while. Now, the fact that we're even viable after going through five different locations is kind of surprising because transitions are hard and it's hard for people to track with us. But we started at, if you guys remember, the Hilltop Ministry Center. Um, that building is northeast of the movie theater in McChesney Park. And uh, that was the building that Ash and I, my wife and I lived just, you know, quarter mile down the street from. And I would drive by it routinely. And on Sunday mornings, especially as I was heading up to Beloit Central, uh, I would be driving by it and it was sitting empty. And that building was instrumental in, in even the launch of our church. Uh, it was a part of the pray, prayer process with God of driving by that building going, God, wouldn't it be wonderful to launch a gospel-centered church in McChesney Park, and maybe we could use a building like this sitting empty to do that? And God was like, mm-hmm. And so those conversations started, and uh, in the early documents, the, that building is on the, on, on the photos. It's, that's the building we were planning to launch in. And in fact, we did our pre-launch meetings there, our monthly meetings there. We did our weekly Bible studies there as we were kind of gearing up uh, to launch the the uh, congregation. And so that was our location. We were excited about it. It was ideal. It was a, you know, a, a very serviceable location. Uh, but what happened was in the midst of our, the, the launch season, that building was sold. Uh, Easter Seals had a school of autism in Rockford. They were bursting at the seams. They needed a bigger parking lot for busing. They needed more space. They needed more accessibility. And so they purchased that property, and we were then hoping to rent directly from them. But they basically said, look, that's so far down the line. Like rentals, we might do that in the future, but we're just trying to get in there and get settled, and we have to repurpose space. We're not even sure what we could offer you. And so that caused us to feel like, okay, well, we've got a date where we're launching the church, and now we don't have a location. 
So we look at all the buildings in the entire, you know, launch area that we've kind of circled, and we just kind of look at it and prayerfully say, okay, God, which one? And a lot, lot happened, but basically we, we uh, ended up renting from Forest Ridge events. M- most of us would know that as Hawks View Restaurant. Uh, it was most recently The Curve. For a few years in there, it was Forest Ridge events. It was a, a steakhouse and an event venue. And so we drew up a contract with the people who were leasing that facility, and we launched our church there. And, and it was awesome. I mean, if you guys were a part of it, those of you that were there, that was a good location for us. In fact, that was, and, and personally, that was my favorite as we've kind of been in five places. I, uh, I look at um, Forest Ridge events and I think, man, that was, that was good for us. The feel of that place, the, uh, just the setup of it. And it wasn't perfect by any means. I mean, I'm well aware of that, but that was where we launched our church. And so it was a place where the first baptisms happened, and it was the place where our first services happened, and it was the place where we really kind of came together and uh, reached it into the community of McChesney Park and started our church. And so we were there for a season, that's number two, Hilltop Ministry Center, Forest Ridge Events, and then the people who were leasing that building said, we're not really making any money on this property, we've got other ventures, so we're going to step away from this. We're not renewing that lease contract, and that kind of put us in an awkward situation, so I reached out directly to the owner, and I said, what if we just paid you? What if we continued to meet at your site, and we just paid you directly? And that was the plan until the week of, Uh, and basically we were trying to get the keys to the castle and everything in writing, and uh, went over to his shop, the owner's shop, and I said, okay, you know, the weekend's coming up, we really need to get this thing figured out. And he said, yeah, I don't want to do that anymore. And so then it's, oh, okay, call everybody, we're homeless. And we were planning to meet where we normally would, but we have to change that plan. And so we came out here. Uh, We came out here. And so that's location number three. We came out here uh, and we spent a summer meeting at the tree farm and we set up the kids' stuff out there. We had church in here. Uh, but that was an, another location that we were at. It was here for a season. During that summer, we drew up a contract with Harlem High School. Uh, we, you know, I've got uh, Dr. Yarbrough is uh, the principal there. He's a believer. He attends Beloit Central. Um, Jason Bloom is a part of the business admin, a good friend, a believer, a really great team, and so we worked with them to draw up a contract for us to be able to meet, meet at the high school there. And we thought, you know, this is a, a really great facility. Everybody in Mcchesney Park knows about it, obviously, and so this will work for us. And we went there, and we were meeting there for a couple of years. Um, we, we would set up shop at the high school. We rented the auditorium. We rented classroom space for the kids, and, uh, and, and it worked, and we did that for a long time. But the truth is, even while we were there, there was something about that venue that just didn't feel like home. And in fact, we had a, a meeting and 21 of our leaders got together and we just kind of brainstormed and we're auditing, you know, what are we up to? What's the next step that we need to take? And even at that point, the leaders kind of, and I didn't anticipate this, but the leaders kind of said, Harlem High School is great and we love it and we appreciate it, but it doesn't feel right. It's not where we're supposed to be. And so we were already brainstorming of, well, what could we do differently to try to make that location work a little bit better? Well, then, as you know, COVID happened, and we were not able to meet at the high school or anywhere for that matter, but we had our equipment here. And we had an ad hoc service that first weekend, and then we, did, we, we streamed out services from here because this is where we had our equipment. And so... That made a lot of sense, and that was kind of the provision that God had given us in that moment, and we did church from the tree farm, and as things relaxed, we took advantage of the wedding garden, and we started holding outdoor services back there, Uh, and so people started showing up, and then uh, as things relaxed more, we created two venues. We created multiple venues. You could do the drive-in church. You could sit outside with us in the elements, or you could come inside, and you could sit inside, and we did different things, and then it relaxed more, and we moved inside. And then because of COVID, the whole tree farm changed their their business model for the year. And so the idea of us not being able to be here during the tree season, well, there were some significant adjustments. So we just stayed put. And it just made a lot of sense for us to kind of ride out the the experience here. And it has been a tremendous blessing. And, and you know, as you guys know, the Williams family, uh, my, my parents, uh, Brad and Ellie, Josh, 
and everyone who has really bent over backwards to make this work for our church. I mean, we should. We owe them a debt of gratitude. We'll, we'll never be able to repay. So, five locations in five years. And the question then is, is that the plan? We, we bought into being portable. I mean, that was a part of the gig from the beginning. We put wheels on everything. I, I taught about it. I preached about it. I wrote about it. I kind of cast vision for it. I said, this is something that God's people have done historically. They're a nomadic people. We can go wherever God wants us to go. Uh, and I've spoken into that, and, and that sentiment has not changed. But at the same time, there's, a, there's been this lingering question for how long? For how long are we going to be portable? And I remember having a meeting with the elders probably three years ago now. We sat right out there, and we discussed the future of our church. And one of the things that came up, and this wasn't on my radar, but one of the, one of the concerns was, are we sustainable as is? Are we sustainable as is? If we never have a permanent location, if we continue to bounce around, can we keep this thing up? And that's a concern. And so it's been something we've been talking about for a long time of, you know, how do we continue to do this in a way that is sustainable? And uh, that, that's the question that we're wrestling with. And therefore, we, we get to a place where an opportunity presents itself for us to purchase property. And we have to ask, is this it? Is this God's plan for us? Is this the next chapter of our story? Well, let me tell you about how this came to be. I'll tell you more about the specific location and the details. Uh, then I'll get to preaching eventually. And then uh, after service, if you'd like, I'll also do a Q&A. Um, but here are some different things that were going on. First off, we were not looking for this, okay? I'll be honest, for five years, I drive around that area that I've got circled on a map, and I look at all the buildings routinely, probably once a month at least. And I pray and I talk to God about it. Um, but it wasn't like we were actively pursuing purchasing property. Uh, many of you send me links all the time. You're like, look at this building, look at this building. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, and I look at them and I pray about them and all these different things. But we don't really have like a team of people that are saying, let's go buy a building. Because you know how this works, right? Like if you're going to buy a house, you you need a, a savings account, you need a little bit of money, you need to get pre-approved. There are all these other things that have to happen. And so we, we're not there. Like we, we've, we've not kind of crossed that bridge yet, even though, you know, a bunch of people kind of push me in that direction. It's like, we just opened checking accounts as a church. We don't have like this huge savings account that we're sitting on. And so for us to be looking at property really is silly. So we were not looking for this thing, but some stuff happened in the community, and I was made aware of it, and we put in a phone call. In fact, one of the dudes from our church is a commercial realtor, and uh, he put in a call. And by the way, side note, this guy that, that's a part of our church is not building crazy. I, I have sat down with him a few times over the life of our congregation to talk about buildings, and he, talk, he tries to talk me out of it. Core, we don't need a building. You, you, know, you don't need a permanent location. He, he talks me out of it. But anyways, he puts in a phone call, and that puts us on the radar of a few different things that are happening. An owner of a property uh, has a church that's been meeting there for 10 years that that church is going, planning to move. And so that owner reaches out directly to me and says, hey, I want you to come check out this facility. So on, honestly, I was not thinking about that building at all. Like even as I look at that area and I know all the stuff that's in there, that building, because another church is there, has never been on my radar. And so I was like, well, okay, uh, I guess. And I felt like I needed to do due diligence on this one. And the numbers were actually surprising. Here's, here's why it was an open conversation from day one. The amount that it would cost to lease that building was a hundred, about $100 less than what it cost to rent Harlem High School. And I was like, okay, that's, that's crazy. Like, we would pay the high school to have access to a facility for a Sunday morning, just Sunday mornings, versus having a lease and having 24-7 access. And obviously, there are additional costs that come with leasing and all of that, and I'm well aware. But I felt like we have to look at this at least. Like, we have to give this thing an honest assessment. So we went over there, we started looking at it, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. It's an old facility. Uh, there's some concerns about it. And so it just felt like, I don't know, guys. Like, I don't know if we want to jump into a lease agreement and have a bunch of work that we need to do 
And then what happens if three years down the road, the owner, because we've improved the property, wants to just flip it and sell it to somebody else, and we can't even afford this building that we've been meeting in. So that was a concern. But then as the conversation progressed, he revealed that he wanted to sell it to us, and he wanted to sell it to us at, a, at an incredible price. Um, and so the numbers really are insane. When you look at this thing, uh, obviously there's a down payment and, and everything else, but we're talking about thousands of dollars less than we have paid each month, each month in rent. Like it's, the, the numbers to me are like, are you sure? Like, like are, are, are we sure that this is how it works? I'm not great at math, so I'm looking at it like that cannot be the case. But the numbers are really, really great. So let me just tell you a bunch of different stories of why I think that God is uh, at work in this. And here's the truth. The way this process has worked was I, the elders and I, we, we talked and we said, we're just going to keep taking next steps. And either doors are going to open or they're going to shut and God's going to make it abundantly clear. But we, we owe it to the congregation to do our due diligence. So let me just tell you about some of the ways that it feels like doors are opening. First off, I was sitting on my neighbor's deck having a conversation uh, with them and th we're just talking shop and, you know, what, what's going on this week? And I say, well, it's kind of crazy. I've been over at this building a couple times. We're looking at purchasing a property for the church. I can't even believe we're having this conversation. And he just starts laughing. I'm like, what's funny? And, he, you know, like, what, why are you laughing? And he's like, Ryan and Ashley, our other neighbors, were just over last night, and actually Ryan's walking across the street as we're having this conversation. He says, Ryan and Ashley were over last night, and they were talking about that building. And they were saying, they think that's the place where Park City Church should be. I invited them into the naming process of our church. We wanted local community members to be a part of it. And so they're talking about our church and specifically about that building. And so I, I'm like texting my wife, did you tell them something? Like, why are they sitting around thinking about us? But that's what they're doing. They're thinking about us and they're talking about that building. Ryan comes over, we're having a, you know, he's talking about, it. he's showing me pictures on his phone. And I'm just like, this is so weird. And then I, I say, Ryan, you know, he works for ABC Supply. I say, you know, there's some work that we would need to do. And, uh, you know, I don't even know where to begin. Uh, but do you have anybody that you would recommend as an architect or, you know, a contractor? And he's like, yeah, uh, that's the world he lives in. So he's, he's like, I'll give you a list and I'll give you personal recommendations for people that you should consult with. So, um, you know, that was just an event that happened that just kind of made me feel like, man, is God at work in this? Another thing that happened was uh, the parking lot needs a lot of attention. And if you know anything about parking lots, they can be very, very pricey. In fact, to build a lot like that one, 100, 100 parking stalls, four handicapped spots, um, it would cost almost as much as the building. And so you don't want to make, you, you don't want to pursue something where you're like, all right, right out of the gate, we've got this repair costs that we can't even afford to do. But I called a friend who's a city planner who works for the city of Rockford. He's an architect. He builds neighborhoods, roads, parking lots. And I say, hey, dude, uh, he's also a believer. He's an elder at First Free in Rockford. So I call him and I say, hey, what do you think about this property? What do you think about the lot and what, what we could do? Would we have to do, you know, all these different improvements to bring it to code? And he says, let me look into it. And then he calls me and he says, I've got an architect who will draw up a plan for the lot as a favor. And he said, and, and I talked to the lady at the village of McChesney Park, and I looked into the special use permit, and it's actually a pretty good, pretty good thing for you guys. You would have the opportunity to make these improvements at a very affordable uh, price and also to be able to do it in different phases. Um, and so I was like, okay, that's kind of crazy, right? That another thing happens where God is connecting dots there. Um, we also have Isaac Smith's dad, uh, he worked, part of his career was working for the Aspen Group. A the Aspen Group is a group that all they do is help churches rehab facilities. They're a design and build company. And so I, uh, Jim Smith is his name, and he has told me over and over again, if you ever get in a situation like I'm describing today, give me a call. It's a good excuse to come visit the, the grandbaby. And I will come out and I will hang out and I'll walk through buildings and give you my, my professional opinion on them. Then I had a meeting with a pastor this week, just this week, 
the, it, crazy, okay, there was a missionary who came to a church service here at the tree farm a few weeks ago. So I sit down with him, and I'm just talking shop with him, and, and he goes, you got to meet this pastor in Stillman Valley. And so he connects the dots. I get a call from a pastor in Stillman Valley, says, let's have lunch, the, you know, this week. And so we sit down, and we're just talking about stuff, and, and I'm telling him about this opportunity, and he's familiar with Roscoe, because he lived here for a little bit. And he's familiar with the location. He thinks this is, a, this is a wonderful opportunity as a church. And then he tells me about this network of churches in the state line area that are passionate about helping gospel-centered churches get started. And he tells me an example of how they already helped a church in Rockford. And he said, you know, our church did this, another church did this, and we were able to raise a significant amount of money. Now, he was not making me any promises, but the implication was there. He was implying that they would come alongside us in some fashion and help us out with this. Then I've got, here's another random thing. I've got this buddy who has a business in Florida and uh, very successful. He's my age. And he, we, we were talking about a month ago and he says, Core, I just sold the business. I was like, oh, good. I know you've been wanting to do that. He says, the way it works is I've got 18 months left on this contract with the buyer and then I can retire. I said, excuse me, you're not even 40 yet. And he's like, yeah, I know, it's crazy. He's like, well, I'm, obviously I'm not going to retire. I'm going to do some different things. So we're just talking. And then as I'm sharing with him about the building, he's like, my wife and I want to support that. And we want to invest in that. And so there are lots of different really incredible things that are kind of going on there where I just feel like, is God continuing to open doors? I, I, I don't know but I want you guys to weigh in on that as well. In my devotions, as I spend time in the Word, I've told you guys before, my plan is uh, reading through the one-year Bible. So every day I read an entry, and as all of this is going on, God is speaking to me in His Word. And I just want to share one with you. I meant to bring my prayer journal along with, but I forgot it at home. But one entry, the day after I had been through the facility with some of you, um, I was in 1 Chronicles chapter 17, and the verse that stood out to me and that I underlined and that I talked to God about was 1 Chronicles 17 verse 9. And God said this, I will provide a place for my people and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. And I underlined that, I prayed about that, I showed it to my wife and I said, isn't this strange? And I'm not the kind of person who wants to say, thus saith the Lord, this is what God is up to, guys. Listen to me, listen to... I'm just saying, in a very guarded way, here's what God is speaking to me in my own personal time with him, and, and it seems to coincide with what's happening in the life of our church. Furthermore, three things stood out in those readings in that one-year Bible, three things that, that God has just laid on my heart that are coming directly from Scripture. Number one, God is with you. Regardless of how this shakes out, that's something that I am holding on to. God is with us. Whether this becomes a reality or not, we can be confident that God is with us and he cares deeply for us. The second thing that showed up, though, was the people are with you. In no way would I want to make a decision like this without consulting with you, the congregation, to be able to say, what do you guys think? And in fact, we'll take a congregational vote on this, but, but what stood out to me in my daily readings in the scripture was the people are with you. Here's the third thing, and this is really important too. The third thing that comes from those readings was that the workers are ready. Meaning, this will be a lot of work. This will take not only time and money and energy, but the skill set of many of you. As we, if we're moving toward this building, there are things that we'll have to do, and you, there will be sweat equity. But God continues to remind me, not only are the people on board, but the workers who are skilled in these things are waiting in the wings for the call. So for those reasons and, and more, I feel like we have to continue to pursue this opportunity. Let me give you briefly four, four things, and uh, then we'll jump into the word. Here are four reasons why we should entertain this opportunity. Number one, stability. Stability. W moving around is hard. When I was doing youth ministry, we would look at the transitions. How do we keep a kid in elementary school and then get them into a middle school ministry? That transition, we lose kids all the time. And from there, how do you get middle school kids into a, a high school ministry? And the way we did it while I was leading the charge was it was the same night. 
One happened earlier, the other one happened later. Same night, same place, and still kids can't make that transition. And so transitions are really hard and moving, moving four different times, being in five different locations. There are people that we have, that, that we have reached along the way um, that aren't here today because there's an instability about our church. Where are they going to be? Where are they going to be next week? Where are they going to be next year? There's an instability about it. Having a permanent location would give us, as First Chronicles says, a home where we will no longer be disturbed. It'll be a place of their own. Secondly, it gives us credibility. One of the things that I've learned about McChesney Park and really northern Illinois over the years is that people assume churches have buildings. As I talk to members of the community and I tell them about us and I tell them about our, you know, our casters, our wheels on the bottom of our equipment and the fact that we set up and tear down every week, which I think is, I think that's a good thing to do. I think that's how churches ought to start. But as I tell members of the community about that, here's their assessment. That's weird. That's weird. In our culture, the expectation is that a church would have a building. And to not have a building is odd. Now, that just is what it is. Like, it's not right or wrong. We just have to recognize the culture that we're dealing with. Most people believe that churches will have buildings, and therefore, they look at us with skepticism if we're portable, and they give us credibility if we're permanent. Another reason why we should consider this is equity. Um, renting is great. Buying in some ways is better. Ash and I, we, we rented uh, for the first several years of our marriage. We loved the fact that somebody else mowed the lawn and that if anything broke, we just made a phone call and somebody would come and repair it. That was wonderful. We made the decision because we weren't sure about the permanence of us being in this location. And so we, we needed that flexibility. If God called us to Papua New Guinea or Nairobi, Kenya, or someplace else in the United States, we were free to do that. And then God said, I want you to stay put. I want you here. Buy a house. And we're like, okay, God, if that's really what you want, even though some of those vocational questions weren't resolved, we, we bought a home in, in Roscoe. And here's the face to palm moment. When, when the mortgage was drawn up and we realized for $75 more a month, we would own a place. 75 more than what we were renting. And because I'm an ordained pastor, there's a whole lot of tax benefits to owning that I wasn't taking advantage of previously. And so it was like, I mean, obviously we had to pay the down payment and that's a lot of money. But to, to be able to say, by owning, you're paying a similar amount, but you actually have equity. That's something that we need to consider. It's a stewardship issue. If we're going to send money away every single month to pay for a place to meet, it might as well be building something for us as a church. So equity is another consideration. A fourth reason why we should consider this is the missional opportunity. Um, as we think about where we want to be, meeting week by week as a church is important to land in a place that is strategic for advancing the mission. Um, we have drawn on the map, it's at, I'll tell you where it is, it's, it's north of 173, it's between the river and I-90, and it's south of Swanson Road. That rectangle there, that's the desired location for a lot of reasons, but that is the spot. And by being in that location, I think we are well situated to reach a whole lot of people. The State of Church Planting 2015 report says the viability of a new church is largely determined by its location. In fact, in the business world, they say you really got to concern yourself with three things, location, location, location. And so as we think about where we want to meet week by week, um, we need to think about that strategic location. And I believe that this is where God is calling us in that rectangle. Uh, that's where we need to be. So this building is um, it's 10714 North 2nd Street. It's where GPS Faith Community has been meeting for the past 10 years. They're planning to move over actually to the Force Ridge event, uh, Events Building. And uh, the owner of 10714 North 2nd Street would like to do business with us. And so here's where we're at. I want to give you one week to pray about this. And I want you to process it. And I want you to have opportunities to ask questions of me and to learn more about this. Um, but then next week, we will do a congregational vote. And we will allow for you to kind of weigh in on it. Is this the next chapter in the life of our church? 
Um, so after church today, I'll hang out. I'll do some q and I'll tell you a little bit more about the details. Um, but those are our next steps. Take a week and pray. And then next Sunday, we will take up a congregational vote. And I'll tell you how that's going to work as we get closer to it. But that is what's going on in the life of our church. Do me a favor. <laughs> Grab your Bibles. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This is a very important way to frame out the discussion. We need to hear this. This is um, something that will even help us process what we're going through today and this decision before us. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'll read the text. We'll pray. We'll, we'll get to work. This is verses 10 to 17. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple, and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. Let's pray. Lord, we ask right now, as we're opening your word, that you would please speak to us. We desperately want you to frame out this conversation so that we're thinking clearly about the project and your desire for it. Help us to do that now in your name. Amen. All right, we've got a project here, an architect, and a workforce. The project is the people. The people of God are the plan. God is building something, and that something is you and I. People matter far more than brick and mortar. God is doing a work, and what he's doing is he's forming a people into a a structure, a, a, a place where he's going to reside. And so the church here in this passage is likened to a building project, and actually previously there was another metaphor. It's like a field. Um, And so Paul is saying that there's this work that's going on, and the work is the building up of the people of God. In fact, look at verse 9. It's outside of what we read, but comes just previous to it. It says, we are co-workers. He's talking about himself as a gospel minister and others like him, like Apollos and others. He says, we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field. That's that first metaphor. And then he says, God's building. So there's a work that's being done, there's a project, and it is the people. God is building something, and it's not a physical structure, it's a spiritual structure. It is the people of God. Look at verses 16 and 17. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple, and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst? God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. The people of God are the project. God is building something. He's putting us together, and this will be the place in which his spirit resides. His spirit will dwell in our midst. This is what we need to be concerned with, not just a physical meeting space. The main priority, the main project is that God is building us up together. In fact, Acts 17, Paul in another place was reminding us of this reality. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and he does not live in temples built by human hands. Whatever whatever meeting place we end up in, wherever we are next year, whether it's here, whether it's, you know, on North 2nd Street, whether it's someplace else, wherever we meet, God does not dwell there in the same way that he dwells in our midst. He doesn't dwell in places built by human hands. He dwells in his people. The project then is is not just the physical location. The project primarily is you and I being built together. 
Now, that's an important word, too. I'd encourage you to underline it. There's something about the togetherness of the people of God that is significant. You can't just say, I'm a Christian, but I don't really care for these people. I don't really interact with these people. No, no, no. To be a part of what God is up to is to be a part of a community. Together, we're being built into the dwelling place of God. You and I, flesh and blood people, are a part of God's plan to make us more like his son. The, the little quirks that we have, the little irritations, the little skirmishes that we have, even within our community, that's all a part of God's plan for building us up and making us more Christ-like. And to try to withdraw from that and say, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to do it my own way. I'm going to do it alone. I'll watch sermons online. I, I'll, you know, listen to my favorite worship music, but I'm not really going to commit to a people. I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to make an agreement to be together with a people. Well, that, that, that doesn't fit what God is up to. God is building a people, and we have to be together in order for that to happen. We have to be able to look at each other and say, we're in this thing together. So there's a project, and it is the people of God. There's an architect. It's God himself. Implied in the metaphor is a strategic design. If God is building this thing up, he cares deeply about it, and he cares about all of the details. He cares about what materials are used. He cares about the foundations of the structure itself. He cares about every aspect that goes into this dwelling place that he will reside. So there's a foundation, verses 10 and 11. Paul is saying, by the, by the grace that God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder. Someone else is now building on it. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. He is a, he's a missionary church planter, so he goes to this location, he preaches the gospel, he lays the foundation. What is the foundation? Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that a church could possibly exist on. He builds this foundation. He builds it as a missionary church planter. He builds it also as an apostle, someone who is, who, who is an observer of the reality of Jesus Christ. He, he, with that special calling as an apostle, that designation of being an eyewitness observer to these things. So he lays this foundation and every church is either built on this or it isn't even a church. So he says, this is the foundation. This is what God cares about, the confession of faith in Jesus Christ. And then on top of that, the, the church is being constructed and how it is built then is significant. Not only the foundation is under consideration, but then the things that go on top of it. He tells us that there are acceptable and unacceptable materials. There are different things that you can do to build a structure. But what, what workers ought to be concerned with is using quality materials. It's the difference between real furniture made out of real wood, which I was moving some this week, and it's heavy, right? It's heavy. You pick it up and it's heavy versus something that's made out of sawdust and glue and that's pressed together and then a veneer is put on it. And that stuff just falls apart. And a lot of churches just kind of have that pressed together thing with a veneer on it. But in reality, it doesn't have any substance. We want to build God's building, his church, in the way that he desires. We want to use the most costly materials possible because he deserves it. We can use these beautiful elements, gold, silver, and costly stones. Look at verse 12. If anyone builds on this foundation using, the first batch is, the good stuff. Gold, silver, and costly stones. That's what we want. We want the stuff that God wants. Or, secondly, we can use stuff that, that will not last. Wood, hay, and straw. But no matter what we use, that work will be revealed. In fact, that's what it goes on to say, verse 13. Their work will be shown for what it is. So God cares about what we're using to build this thing up. He cares about every aspect of it. So we need to be asking questions like, what is the overall design plan? What does God want for this community of faith? What is he seeking to accomplish with us? What would it look like to be the building that God intends for us to be, to be the people that God wants us to be? Secondly, we need to ask questions like, what materials are needed then? What are the costly materials? What are the enduring materials? What are the things that God wants us to use? And that would include, in, in my estimation, as I've read this passage, it includes clear, sound teaching. 
It, it's helping people understand the truth of who God is and what he has done and helping them to understand what that means as disciples and followers of his and helping them to live in light of those truths. Those are the materials that are needed. And then finally, how can the efforts be organized? How can we organize the building project so that it is um, executed well? In fact, in the one-year Bible, more recently I've been in the story of Nehemiah. And what, what happens there? There's a, there's a design plan and it's a coordinated effort. People are building in different places and they've got different responsibilities. And that ensures that when the structure is is, you know, raised, it's actually going to look like there was a plan here. The church needs the same kind of consideration. We don't just want to piecemeal, oh, all these people are doing different things. It doesn't really matter. You just kind of do your own thing. No, there needs a coordinated effort to build up the church in the way that God wants. So God is the architect. He gives us the blueprint. We want to follow his leadership. And finally, there's a workforce. There are gospel workers. Those who are working on the church are accountable to the architect. Verse 10, I, Paul, laid the foundation as a wise builder. Someone else is building on it, but each one should build with care. If you have any involvement in ministry, be sure that you are working with care, understanding your responsibility to the architect himself. Everyone who's a builder, everyone who's a worker on this project answers to God. And so as we think about the church and we think about our involvement in her and we think about the ministries that individuals engage in, that you engage in, that I engage in, that that whatever it is that we're doing, we need to take care that we're doing it with consideration of God's overall plan. There's accountability for it. There will be a testing, verse 13. Their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. God one day is going to expose the way that we've worked on the church. He's going to reveal by fire the quality of what we've built. There is a judgment coming. This is not a damning judgment for those who are believers in Christ. There is no condemnation. But if we are lazy or inattentive or cutting corners in the way that we think about the church, that will be exposed. He will show us the deficiencies of our work. At my house, as you walk through it, it I'm not much of a carpenter, uh, but I love building stuff. And so you walk through, and at first you're like, that's beautiful. And then you get close, and you look at the seams. And you go, huh, there's a lot of caulk and a lot of paint. Um, that's what God is going to do. He's going to give us a close-up inspection. And we're going to see the quality of the work. Now, if we're faithful, there's a reward. If What he has built survives, the builder will receive a reward. He's going to compensate those who have done their work well. But verse 15 reminds us, if it is burned up, the the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved even though only as one escaping through the flames. So again, the project is the people. That's what we're concerned with. The building is, I said this in the first tour that we took of the place. This is a means to an end. This is not the end. If, if this is what God is opening to us, it's a building. It's not, it's not the promised land. It's not, you know, the destination. What, what we really care about is the people being built up. And can that help or will it hinder? That's what we're wrestling with. There's a, there's a plan, and that plan is you and I being built together into the dwelling place of God. There's an architect. It's God himself. He cares more than any of us could possibly imagine. He cares about his church and how it, is, how it is arranged, how it's put together, what it ends up becoming. He cares deeply about it. And so any of us who are involved at any level with this thing should take care how it is being built. We should be deeply concerned with what God is up to. And then by the grace of God being laid on the foundation of Jesus Christ, we will be the place where God himself resides. So let's pray. Lord, I ask right now that you would help our faith community to discern this moment. We want to know what you're doing. More than anything else, we believe that you are working on us. But Lord, as we consider our future together, would you give us a clear and compelling vision of of what that's going to look like? Make it plain for us. Help us to be of one mind on this thing. I know that there are different opinions that 
All of us are coming at this thing from different angles. Some of us are hearing about this for the very first time. Lord, over the course of the next week, I'm praying that you would give unity and that you would bring clarity, that it would become obvious of what you are doing and then give us the faith to walk in obedience. So Lord, um, this is your church. You care more about her than any of us or even all of us combined. So would you help us to discern what your plan is for us? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay.